Well, we had a thunderstorm overnight here in LA. In other words, it drizzled for a few minutes, but I could have sworn I saw some lightning. In any event, it was enough to change my plans from going to the beach to having a stroll at the park. And I was happy to stumble upon my favorite fluffy white goose who still won't eat my seeds, but I have a feeling that soon he may let me pet him. So I'll try and we'll see what happens in the next episode. When it comes to my duck friends, they always have a healthy appetite and are more than happy to eat out of my hand like it was a buffet. I've come to learn that while ducks like grains and insects, geese are mostly herbivores, which is probably why that big white goose would rather graze in the grass and is so disinterested when I toss kernels of corn at him. Ducks, geese, and swans are in the same biological family, and while it's possible for a goose and a duck to mate, the resulting eggs would likely not be fertile, at least not to my knowledge, but the combination sure does sound interesting. That said, there are numerous examples of hybrid animals from different species that are viable, meaning they can and do produce offspring that are fertile and can go on to have their own offspring. Spoiler alert, humanity is one such example of a hybridization of different hominin species, but I'll get to that later on. For now, let's start with my favorite example, the liger. What are you drawing? A liger. What's a liger? It's pretty much my favorite animal. It's like a lion and a tiger mixed. Bread for its skills and magic. Hmm. These hybrid cubs are the offspring of a male lion and a female liger. So the liger was obviously fertile, even if the male ligers are infertile. In the case of a cross between a leopard and a lion, which is called a lepon, both the male and the female are fertile, meaning their offspring are viable and can have offspring of their own. Many dog breeds originated from hybridization. Domesticated dogs can also be hybridized with wolves. This is an example of a Czechoslovakian wolf dog, a breed that began as an experiment conducted in Czechoslovakia in 1955. Dogs can also be hybridized with coyotes, called koi dogs, with wolf and coyotes also able to mate and produce offspring. DNA analysis consistently shows that all existing red wolves carry coyote genes. This has caused a big problem for canid taxonomy, as hybrids are not normally thought of as species. Dogs and jackals are another form of canine hybrid. Although hybridization between wolves and golden jackals has never been observed, evidence of such occurrences was discovered through mtDNA analysis on jackals in Bulgaria. In fact, Hybridization is much more common than scientists have previously thought, occurring in the wild with 10% of animal species alive today and in 25% of plant species. So rather than being a genetic dead end, hybridization is now recognized as a driving force in how new species come about. Which brings us to the howler monkey, the loudest land mammal in the world, which primatologists claim broke off into two distinctly different groups around 3 million years ago, evolving into genetically separate populations with different number of chromosomes and therefore considered to be different species. The mantled howler monkey and the black howler monkey, only recently coming together again 10,000 years ago in what scientists call a hybrid zone in Tabasco, Mexico. This 12-mile hybrid zone is where the two isolated populations coexist and occasionally interbreed, 
creating hybrid offspring that scientists recognize as a new, unique species. When this interracial crossbreeding happens, neither one of the original monkey populations will accept the new hybrid monkey species into their geographic territory, restricting them to the area in between the two populations. In other words, each of the isolated and genetically distinct populations of monkey, which scientists consider a biologically distinct species, exhibit a simian racism, which has nothing to do with socioeconomics or whatever racist tendencies in humans is blamed on, but entirely on genetics. What is interesting is that people have a hard time visually identifying the hybrids because their phenotype resembles one of the original populations. In genetics, the phenotype is the set of observable characteristics or traits of an organism. So, this means that the length of the tail, the structure and shape of the skull, the color of the fur, none of the physical appearances in itself could identify the hybrid, but it became immediately apparent when the DNA was sequenced. This hybridization phenomena is mirrored in the study of human biological variation, or modern human races of the Holocene, which is a biological reality and not a social construct. We now know that people are comprised of various degrees of archaic hominin admixture, which cannot be easily determined just by looking, but becomes irrefutable when genetic sequencing takes place. Although the animal hybrids I've mentioned so far are from modern species, human hybridization happened tens of thousands of years ago among specimens which are now considered extinct, yet can still be identified in DNA because some of the parent species' genes remain present and visible during genomic analysis. Of course, when we think of human hybridization, it puts biblical verses, such as the one in Genesis about the sons of God mating with the daughters of men into a new light. Not to mention Plato's description of the demise of the Atlanteans having to do with too much, quote, mortal admixture, which allegedly took place during the Ice Age. Hybrid humans existed in prehistory. For example, Neanderthals and modern humans, or Cro-Magnon, interbred from 35,000 to about 28,000 years ago. Europeans have between 1 and 5% Neanderthal genetics, while the percentage is even greater in East Asians. Sub-Saharan Africans have a trace amount of Neanderthal DNA, even though no Neanderthal has ever been found in Sub-Saharan Africa. The reason is, because after hybridization in Europe, hybridized Europeans entered into Africa and interbred with an archaic ghost species, which got its name because it's only been detected genetically in the DNA of people from Sub-Saharan Africa and has not yet been identified in the fossil record. So modern Africans are a hybrid race of the ghost species, which I suspect is Homo erectus, or another very archaic hominin, and Europeans who already had interbred with Neanderthal. In other words, there absolutely and conclusively was no out of Africa in the sense of sub-Saharan African people with dark skin leaving Africa and magically mutating into Asians and then Caucasians. This obsolete hypothesis will go down in history as a bigger fraud than the Piltdown Man where a baboon's jaw was glued onto a human skull and displayed in the British Museum for over 40 years as a missing link. Instead, the first fully modern human, which is Cro-Magnon, which populated Western Europe and Northern Africa about 35,000 years ago, entered Sub-Saharan and Western Africa and interbred with an archaic hominin 
and this gave rise to modern sub-Saharan Africans that never left Africa, since these genetics cannot be found anywhere else in the world. Caucasians and East Asians, for example, do not have sickle cell anemia, a disease strictly attributed to sub-Saharan Africans, thought to have been brought about as a survival mechanism against malaria, as malaria does not develop in people with mild cases of sickle cell. There are other human biological variations between races, from the different number of vertebrae between populations, some having an extra rib, and even differences in dentation, meaning teeth. There are subtle differences, such as in earwax, as silly as that sounds, but it's taught in anthropology classrooms and other variations that are no longer taught, such as genetic variation in IQ and behavior. Of course, the most obvious indicator of hybridization in humanity is the mystery surrounding Rh negative blood, which is neither a good nor a bad thing, but an immune response, a natural biological barrier where the body of an Rh negative mother attacks and tries to reject her own unborn baby, which could result in death if it were not for modern medical intervention, where the administration of a shot prevents a fatality. If humanity all evolved from the same African ancestor, the blood would be compatible, but it's not. This is why we see this phenomenon, a physiological rejection of developing embryo, as we see it in other hybridization scenarios with other animal species. Being Marxist or communist or part of an egalitarian movement does not change biological reality. Either does censorship, name calling, or obsessive political correctness. Scientific correctness does not care about political correctness. In Japan, people often ask each other what their blood type is before dating, the same way that in the West people ask each other what astrological sign they are. According to a 2016 study of 3,355 Japanese people, 99% knew their blood type. And ironically, I don't know my own blood type, but in my case it's by choice, as in my line of research, not knowing has helped to keep my work objective and unbiased. I did, however, have my DNA sequenced through Ancestry.com, which did not reveal my blood type, which I'll leave a link to in the description for those that are interested in watching that video. In Japan, blood types are considered an important indicator of a person's personality, and most of the Japanese population is type A. People with this blood type are described primarily as well organized. They are said to like to keep things neat, but can be stubborn and get stressed out easily, while valuing harmony in others. Agriculturalists are the root of blood type A, and it's been said that working collaboratively on farms develop these blood type personality traits. Blood type O is often described as optimistic, outgoing, having leadership abilities, and good at setting the mood for groups of people. They don't sweat the little things, a trait that is said to get under the skin of more sensitive A types. They are known often for showing up late to events, but also incredibly resilient and flexible, enabling them to roll with the punches. Blood type B is generally described as having a tendency to be selfish, but on the other hand, also known and respected for their unique creativity. Blood type B has a strong sense of curiosity, but at the same time loses interest easily. Though there are a lot of positives to B types, people tend to focus on the negative aspects of sometimes being loners, which is attributed historically to ancestors that were nomadic meaning people that roamed from place to place. Blood type AB is a hybrid of A and B, with traits from two different personalities mixed together. They're often seen as dual-natured and complicated. For example, they're shy like A types, but can also be outgoing like type B. Blood type AB is the rarest in Japan and in many other parts of the world, and the stereotype that goes with it is that AB people are eccentric. Japan, incidentally, has undergone a genetic and racial shift in its history, as prior to being populated by the current 
mostly East Asian phenotype. It was primarily inhabited by the ancestors of the current minority Ainu population, who have many Caucasian features, such as facial hair. Prior to the Ainu, we have the Jomon period in Japanese prehistory, dating back to over 14,000 years ago, by what clearly was a Caucasoid type of people. Anthropologists called them Asiatic Caucasoids because they had facial features and body hair that seemed more European than Asian. In fact, the Ainu are thought to be a remnant of a very ancient population that was once widespread in the Old World. This is 28,000 years from China. What we know of these early Asians is based on just a few skulls. It's one of the earliest anatomically modern Homo sapiens in Asia. One of them is a 28,000-year-old specimen from China, which looks very much like the 9,000-year-old spirit caveman. And there are some marked similarities in the facial architecture. Tremendous similarity in the shapes of the eye orbits in the sense that they're both somewhat rectangular, similar inner orbital distance, overall appearance of the orbits, the shape of the nose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But many of the features, including mm -hmm. the very heavy mandible and the prominent, prominent mm -hmm. symphysis here, those features are, mm -hmm. are very much the same. Hiroshi Oshima the former Japanese ambassador to nationalist Germany believed that the noble caste in Japan, the Daimo and the Samurai, were descended from gods of celestial origin, which is similar to the German National Socialist's own belief that the Nordic race did not evolve, but came directly down from heaven to settle on the Atlantic continent. I recently made a video presentation called Atlantis and Antediluvian Anthropology, and included a link in the description if you haven't seen it yet and would like to. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments, so please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.